have, having a strong and growing economy and cultivating that environment is harder than ever to do. Let me say that again. Having a strong and growing economy is harder than ever. And here's why. Today I did a tour across our state at each of the three institutions of higher education. We started at the Georgetown campus of Delaware Tech and Community College, and we visited a lot of workforce training programs there for people who are going out to get a two-year degree or a certification, uh, and that was in the health care areas of nursing and radiology. We also visited a classroom for auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, it turns out that just about every employer that I talk to in our state that runs big diesel trucks is looking for diesel mechanics. And guess what? Those guys and gals make a good income to support a middle class way of life. We've got to get our young people thinking about those kinds of careers and there were a good 20, 25 or 30 people in this, uh, in this classroom at Delaware Technical Community College. I moved up to Dover and we did a great tour of Delaware State University and we're, we were presented with a lot of new research programs that they're do, doing at Delaware State. We met with the mass communication team, which is one of the um, most highly attended programs at Delaware State University and toured their facilities. We have been making significant investments in Delaware State University since Tom Carper was governor in the mid to, 19, uh, mid to late 1990s. And that campus and those facilities and their offerings are better than they ever were, and their enrollment of Delawareans is higher than it's ever been. We have a scholarship program that was created a few years ago called the Inspire Scholarship Program, which pays a significant part of the tuition for a Delaware student to go to Delaware State University. We have a similar program uh, called the SEED Scholarship Program that we work with with Delaware Tech and with the University of Delaware, again, to support Delaware students going through those programs. It turns out that the most important thing in having a strong and growing economy is the quality of the workforce. We created a, a new entity to do our economic development activities called the Delaware Prosperity Partnership. It's a partnership between the government agencies and the private sector and they're working hard to cultivate this environment where, where businesses can be successful. Turns out that the most important thing that businesses are looking for is a high quality workforce. And so our efforts in education, preschool through elementary, secondary and higher education is more important than it's ever been before. For, for the longest time, and particularly in this area, in the area where I grew up along the Delaware River in Claymont, we relied pretty significantly in Delaware on old industrial jobs. Was, when I was running for governor, we had a, a round table with folks to talk about the kinds of things that we needed to make Delaware stronger and Delaware's economy stronger. And somebody said, we need some new old jobs. That makes sense to you? I knew exactly what he was talking about. New old jobs. The kind of jobs that the parents in the neighborhood that I grew up in, you know, worked in. And the industrial, the industrial jobs along the Delaware River from Claymont Steel into Sunoco into southeastern Pennsylvania. The Port of Wilmington down to uh, the oil refinery along the Delaware River. And, and our two automobile manufacturing uh, plants here in our state. Those jobs are fewer and far between today. We need to do everything we can to cult cultivate those jobs, and that's why we work so hard on the partnership with uh, Golf Tainer to expand and develop uh, the, Del the Port of Wilmington. We have an agreement with the company to make a over a, a half a billion dollars in investment to create new jobs and to secure those good old jobs at the Port of Wilmington and the new facility at Edgemore. In order for every child to be successful, we need to make sure that we're giving them a first class education. And uh, Representative Cook introduced uh, Dr. Blakely, but we also have Dr. Susan Bunting, who's the Secretary of Education, who is here, and Darrell Green, who's head of the Office of Innovation and Improvement 
working hard to make sure that every children, and here are the three objectives. Children learn to read from preschool to third grade, and then they read to learn after that. So if they're not reading at grade level at third grade, their prospects after that are not as good. So we need to make sure that all our children can read at grade level at third grade. And we're not doing as well as we need to be doing on that process. So this is one of our priorities and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Increasingly, science, technology, and engineering and math is where the jobs of the future are gonna be. So we need to make sure that our kids are graduating with proficiency in math. And it starts by being proficient in middle school and so eighth grade proficiency in math is the second of our main objectives. And then lastly, to make sure that every child, every single one, graduates from high school ready to either go out into the workforce as like a diesel mechanic or as a tradesperson, again, jobs that pay well and they're high demand in our economy right now, or on to higher education. And that's why it's so important for us to invest in college and making sure that our, our students are college ready as well. One of the biggest challenges that we face in Delaware, particularly on the budget side, is the increasing cost of health care. But there aren't many folks in this room that are getting close to using much health care as you get older. I can see we got a really young crowd out there. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Johnson, I was, I'm just reflecting my own over 60-year-old self in that respect. And, somebody who has started to use the healthcare system quite a bit, but most of you I'm sure in this room know how expensive healthcare it is uh, in our state. And frankly, we don't as, do as good a job with respect to uh, the health of, of individuals. And so that's a big priority. The quality, improving quality, while lowering or keeping costs from growing uh, at a rate that's unsustainable. Safe and secure communities is absolutely essential to the quality of life in every place, and I'm sure it's not this way out here uh, in the Route 9 corridor. For many years when I was Lieutenant Governor, I worked with then Representative J.J. Johnson and Councilman Jay Street on policing activity in the Route 9 corridor. It was so important for the quality of life in the neighborhoods around that, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And then lastly, making government more efficient and effective. The fact of the matter is, is that our expenses, particularly healthcare expenses, grow at a rate faster than our revenue. And so that we've got to find a way in government to make sure that we're operating more efficiently so we can afford the things that are so important in terms of education and quality healthcare. So next slide, how are we doing? Our economy is pretty darn strong right now. Unemployment has ticked down below 3.8% for the last time in more than a decade. We've created the Delaware Prosperity Partnership, as I mentioned. When I talk to employers across our state, what do you think the biggest problem that they have? And when we were down on the University of Delaware campus today where there was a half a billion dollars of construction going on. Their biggest problem is they can't find the people that they need to do the work. And we have the same problem with high technology jobs. So it's our job in the public sector to make sure that we have a workforce that's trained to be able to do the high tech and science and technology based jobs and the trades jobs that are so important for those, uh, for those construction companies. We modernized the Coastal Zone Act. There are 14 sites that were abandoned and polluted. And so we decided to try to open a, those sites to redevelopment for those new old jobs so that a firm would come in, clean up the site, which benefits all of us and the river, and create a development that creates jobs. So the modernization of the coastal land. Uh, finally, I mentioned the expansion of the Port of Wilmington, so critically important for the people that have those jobs now, and for the additional jobs that we'll create as they expand the port facilities into Edgemore. Somebody said it earlier, there's nothing more important that we do than the investment in our children. Just nothing more important. We can't be successful as a state unless we have that educated workforce. Individuals can't be successful unless they reach their greatest potential educationally. And so this has got to be our, our higher, pri highest priority. The first thing we did was we re reorganized the Department of Education. 
of the leadership of Secretary Bunting. Mm -hmm. So the department was more focused on helping Dr. Blakely and his people in the Colonial School District than in regulating them and riding herd in a different, less constructive kind of way. And that's why we set up the Office of Education, Innovation, and Improvement to help districts meet their obligations and make sure that all their children are proficient in reading at third grade, math at eighth grade, and graduation ready to go to work or into college. The most important thing we're doing, in my view, in, in this budget, and we'll talk a little bit of, about it, is making investments in high-need schools and children from low-income backgrounds and English learners. It turns out that those children aren't doing as well as the rest of the children. And that's just unacceptable. Everybody needs to have an equal opportunity to be successful, and we need to invest in those children in those schools to make sure they're meeting those objectives that we've set for all our children. And fi finally, we're making progress in protecting our quality of life. We've created the nation's first overdose system of care. We have a terrible problem with uh, opioid addiction. Our lieutenant governor is doing a tremendous job leading the Behavioral Health Consortium, and they've come up with a plan, that one, of, one of the items of which was to establish this continuum of care to increase treatment opportunities for those that are addicted. It's just a scourge in every community across our state. And it doesn't matter whether you're in an urban environment, a suburban, suburban environment, in a rural area in, in Delaware, the chances are that you have this kind of problem. Last year, 345 people died of, a, of an opioid overdose. That's just unacceptable. We launched the healthcare benchmark, again, to focus the system on improved quality and reduced costs. And we have an, an incredible collaboration going on right now with the Family Services Cabinet Council to make sure we're doing a better job in educating our children, particularly in the city of Wilmington, and working with Mayor Przicki in cutting down on the, the violence and the shootings in the city of Wilmington. The new chief is making tremendous progress there. So here are some of the investments that we're making. I talked about the budget that we presented before the legislature broke. They're doing their budget write-ups right now. And we have director of the Office of Managed Budget, I think Mike Jackson, in the back of the room. So when you have your budget questions, Mike is, is back there ready for the answers. He's also working with the members of the Joint Finance Committee. It's now the legislator's opportunity to mark up our budget and hopefully approve some of the priorities that we have and do it in a responsible way, and we, we'll talk about that. I've, I've said a lot about the, the Port of Wilmington. This agreement with Gulf Tainer actually will, will result in a half a billion dollars of investment by a private company and not by state taxpayers which frees up money for other investments in our, in our economy. I mentioned that we have both the new old jobs in the industrial sector, but we also have to cultivate an innovation economy, and we passed legislation to create a tax credit, an angel investor tax credit, and that's a credit that goes for small companies, mostly uh, high-tech companies, uh, as they access sources of capital. We have a real opportunity presented by the federal tax reform bill that identified 25 areas in our state that they called opportunity zones, so there's a tax benefit for individuals to invest in those, uh, in those distressed communities. Some of those 25 are in this general area around the Port of Wilmington, in South Wilmington, around the riverfront area, all the way up uh, the Delaware River to the old steel mill in Claymont, and various uh, communities up and down their state. And lastly, I saw Secretary Cohen is here, the Secretary of Transportation. This $3.2 billion uh, over the next six years uh, for transportation improvements, including $1.7 billion of that for Newcastle County and $250 million in the city of Wilmington, including the bridge that goes uh, from near where Frawley Stadium is to the south side of the river, hopefully opening, opening up opportunities for economic development on that side of the river as well. How many people have been to the new 76ers uh, Fieldhouse? Pretty amazing new facility there yeah. in South Wilmington. 
great for our kids, great for our community, great for all of us. I see some members of city council are here. Uh, council President Chabaz is here. Thanks for coming and thanks for the partnership there uh, along the riverfront. Again, nothing more important than improving the schools for all of our children. The biggest and most important uh, proposal in my budget is to provide $60 million over the next three years for what we call opportunity funding. This is funding that will go to school districts and schools to benefit low-income children and those that are English language learners. It's not just throwing money at the problem, it's uh, an exercise over the next three years to work with schools and districts and teachers to figure out what it takes to make sure that those children can be successful. And, and, and again, remembering what our objectives are. Proficiency in reading at third grade, math proficiency in eighth grade, and then graduation ready to go to college or out into the workforce. So $60 million, $20 million each year allocated to the districts. And uh, as we said, Dr. Blakely's here to Colonial District in this case. Is anybody here from a district other than Colonial or is this it's pretty much all Colonial? Some, Christina maybe? Oh, Brandy one. So you did a road trip down here tonight. So again, uh, really the highest priority in our budget and a real important initiative for all of us. We're working very closely through a memorandum of understanding and Garrell is heading that up for our team uh, to improve uh, the Christina, the schools in the Christina School District in the, in the city of Wilmington. That includes uh, Byard and Pulaski on the west side. It includes Palmer and South Wilmington, Stubbs and Bancroft on the east side. And so we have a, a plan to recapitalize some of those buildings and to invest in those children in programs to, to help them be successful, meet those objectives. Again, we lose a lot of kids in middle school, and we one of our priorities, as I said, is to make sure that children are proficient in math by eighth grade. And so in our budget, we've included some, some uh, spending for math coaches and reading. While we're making the investments in jobs, economic development in our schools, and then we're, we're gonna put our excess revenue over that target into one-time spending, such things as those investments in higher education, and into a reserve fund. So last year, the first thing the legislature did was set aside, at our request, $48 million into this reserve fund. Why put it in a reserve fund? When, we, when the economy softens, and we don't have the revenue we have today, if we don't have that reserve fund to get us over that little soft spot, we're gonna to have to go back to you or to the business sector and raise taxes or cut programs that are important to children and, and others in our state. And so we've proposed to add to that $47 million with another 40 some plus, almost $50 million uh, to, uh, to give us a $90 million, $92 million uh, reserve fund. Responsible budgeting, I mentioned some of these excess resources going to one-time expenses in higher education, in farmland preservation, and land acquisition. Lots of real opportunities to enhance our quality of life and address our priorities in a budget in a real sustainable, responsible way. I talked about government operating more effectively and more efficiently. We've established a group called the Government Efficient Efficiency and Accountability Review. Rick Geisenberg, our Secretary of Finance, who is here somewhere, there he is in the back, is the chair of that group. And that group is working on a consistent basis to find ways to save money and operate more efficiently. And then lastly, probably the biggest challenge that we face here in Delaware and that the country faces is to uh, reduce the growth in healthcare costs and to improve the health out outcomes for Delaware families tax period. We can't be successful again as individuals and as businesses unless we um, meet this challenge. So that's it. That's the state of our state today. The state of our state today in Delaware is strong and getting stronger. And with your help and the help of these members of the General Assembly as we work through our budget, we're going to make some really, uh, I think, important investments to make Delaware an even better place for all of us to live, work, and raise our families. Thank you for, the, for coming out tonight, and I look forward to all your questions.
So I have a microphone on this side of the room. My friend Jordan on the other side of the room. So just raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get you the microphone. So we take comments too. If you don't have a question, you just want to say, look, you should be doing this and not that. We want to hear that as well as questions as well. So lead us off. Hi, Governor Councilwoman. Harley. How you doing? Harley. Good. Thank you for sharing your vision with us on today. Um, my question to you is this. On your chart, where we strengthening our economy under opportunity zones. Yeah. Who can I speak to about that? Um, in the 4th Councilmatic District, I have at least two communities that I feel as though could benefit from that. Who should I talk to? So, we've, uh, so Albert Shields in our office, uh, if you call the governor's office, Albert can tell you we, we have already identified of those sites, so the process was each state get it down a certain allocation, mm -hmm. Delaware being a small state got 25 of those, and so we were to identify 25 census tracts and communities across our state that would be eligible for these benefits. My guess is they include uh, areas in your district. Yes. I don't know off the top of my head, but there are several in and around the city of Wilmington. I mentioned area around the port of Wilmington, mm -hmm. somewhere, not all of the riverfront, but part, I think, on the south side of the riverfront. That's correct. So, um, Albert can give you that information. We are on, on an ongoing basic basis marketing those sites. Okay. The Biden Institute at the University of Delaware is doing uh, some work on those sites as well, so we look forward to working with you, with other members of council and the mayor as well. Okay. Real opportunities there. That's absolutely. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. I'm Jim Paradise from uh, Belfont area, which is nice to be down here. Um, I got something a little bit personal. My son is a new teacher at Dickinson High School, third year for him. Um, and he doesn't get paid all that well. And I see a lot of things about education, but how about paying the teachers a little bit more so we get better teachers in the classrooms? So there, there, no question about it. There, there are, um, is an increase in salary for teachers uh, in the budget. There was an increase in salary for teachers and other uh, state employees last year. We are, particularly with our agreement with the with the Christina District in Wilmington, we do would like to pay the teachers that teach in those schools more. If I had my way, I would uh, pay teachers more. Nobody does more important work in our state uh, than the teachers. Obviously, it's a cliche that they have the future of our, of our state in their hands, and they certainly do. Thank you for the uh, work that your son is doing in Dickinson. Governor over here, Ebony yes. from Claymont. Ho, oh, Claymont's in the house. <laughs> it's my hometown. Hi, Governor Carney. I'm actually here representing St. Francis Hospital. I wanted to thank you for including Tobacco 21 to your 2019 legislative agenda. Um, that's one of our advocacy measures for tobacco to fight at St. Francis as well as the American Cancer Society Cancer Answer Network. Um, in addition, I have a question. You talk a lot about, about the healthcare spending, and I was wondering, is there any money focusing on some social determinants of health that are causing a lot of our healthcare problems? So it turns out that we do make a lot of investments in the social determinants of health, and you're exactly right that there are a lot of factors out there that impact negatively, negativity, social factors that impact negatively on, on uh, an individual's and a community's health, and those uh, area secretary Odom Walker is an expert in that area. We're really, I think, through the benchmark, really gonna to start to focus on those population health kinds of ideas and the social determinants. And by the way, it's very, those are very important negative factors in our ability to get those children to read proficiently at third grade. One of the things that Darrell's done a tremendous amount of work on is in getting our teachers and personnel uh, educated on trauma and the effect that children, that trauma has on children and their ability to learn. We have a lot of activities going on in schools and districts uh, with teachers and support personnel to help uh, children deal with the trauma that they bring from home and from the community. And those are the kind of social determinants that not only negatively affect those individuals' health, but affect the children's progress in school. Maybe one of the biggest challenges that we have, and I think it'll also be one of the reasons that finding the solutions 
to making sure that children from disadvantaged backgrounds can meet those proficiency standards is going to be so difficult because it's got so many other factors that are at play there. But we need to we need to get down in there and figure it out. Some schools across our state, we were just visiting a Laurel School District, they have doubled their proficiency rates uh, in reading and math in, in, in their schools there. Now, a very different situation than some of the schools that we have up here, but it can be done. We just need to roll up our sleeve, put some additional resources to it, work together and collaboratively, collaboratively and figure out how to do it. And that's a really great observation. And one that Secretary Evan Walker really brings a lot of expertise to the table and, and addressing those concerns. To find a way to make sure that in undergrad education, those who are going into the teaching profession learn how children learn, how their brains function, behavioral, da da da, whatever. There's a lot more to it than right. just being poor and coming from the family. Right. So that's, that's one point. Couldn't and agree more. The other point would be for the secretary, I'd love to see if we could restore creativity and let teachers teach and let them talk about how testing should be done, what should be done. They are blocked now by curriculum and stuff that we buy and the test has to be given and standardized. Children don't come in standardized packages. Everybody does. <laughs> important thing. The last thing I want to say is that there is no higher profession than teachers. I agree with everybody in here that says everything, but I think that, and the secretary knows it because we've talked about it, we have a little group, we should elevate teachers to the level of educational engineers. They're working on your child's brain five days a week, seven, well what is it, five days a week, <laughs> seven hours a day, 12 years of their life. It feels like seven days a week. Well, Bibi, you know more about education than I ever will. And what you said, one thing that you said really struck me, and essentially it is that, you didn't say it quite this way, is that every child is different. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. And that's what makes it so hard. Yes. Right? Because it'd be easy if we had unlimited resources and we had a tutor for every child. Right? Yes. But we have pretty good teacher-student ratios in K to three, it's a target of 21, 22. And I was in a school this week and they had 16, 17, 18, and then an eight, but that's still 16, 17, 18 kids to one teacher. So we've gotta find ways to be able to, to, as you say, figure out how each child learned. We had a collaborative. When you focus on one objective, as we have with third grade reading, you can really get down into it. Yes. And our reading specialists, and our teachers, and our instructional leaders have done just that. And they've come up with a plan, and it does include mm -hmm. teacher preparation yes. at UD, yes. Delaware State University, Wilmington College, and yes. the rest. But we've got to roll up our sleeves and commit to those objectives right. and get it done. Governor, right back here, Yolanda. Hello. Oh, way back. Okay. <laughs> How you doing, Governor? Good. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the 149th General Assembly as well as yourself as bringing back the Delaware Prescription Assistance Program for our seniors and our disabled. Uh, that's the one thing. As well as I was hoping that you can give us a little more information, if possible, on the reinsurance program uh, so, for the marketplace. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so the Affordable Care Act was a great thing in Delaware because it provided an opportunity and plans for people that were working every day with companies that didn't provide health insurance. It gave them a place to go. But it didn't do what it, what it did, did in some of the bigger states like New York and California, which is create more competition among the insurers so that you get, get better rates. We have like one or two insurance companies before, and we got one or two insurance companies now, right? Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Aetna, and, that, and that's it, right? So, as a result, and we're a small state, 
We don't have a big population to spread what's the, called the, the risk, risk, the cost the of that of that population the uh, into one, you know, across a lot more people, right? And so if you have an unhealthy population among that group, the costs are going to be high. So the reinsurance mechanism is a mechanism to help those companies reduce their risk. So we, the state, with, a, with a, some assistance from the federal government and a waiver, we would assume some of the deep end risk for somebody that had, I don't know, a, um, a premature child, which can cost lots of money, or a long hospitalization, which can cost lots of money. That way, the insurance companies can price it for everybody else a lot more affordably, right? If that makes sense. So that's the idea. It probably won't drive costs down, but it'll help stabilize costs from going up further on those exchanges, if that makes any sense. We're, we're just not big enough to be able to do it any other way, we determined, although there are other things that we're looking at. So we used to be, say, before the Affordable Care Act, we had 110,000 people in our state that were uninsured. And remember, they're not people that are unemployed. Those people generally have Medicaid, right? They're people who go to work every day. They just don't get insurance from their employer, right? Or they're somebody that's in business for themselves, right? They're a single. Uh, so now, after the Affordable Care Act, we're down to probably fewer than 50,000 people that are uninsured, which is way better. It's not. It's not uh, optimal, but it's way better than it was. We think that a program like that will help keep that affordability uh, for those uh, individuals that are on those plans. We'll see. You know, it's right now, if, if you're in that market, those rates have gone up pretty dramatically over the first two or three years in the program because there was more risk in that population, more cost, healthcare costs to spread across those that are were insured in it. Hi, Governor Carney. My name is Kim Lopez. I'm from Wilmington, and I'm a product of the Colonial School District. Um, Dr. So Blakey right there. He's been <laughs> recognized about 200 times over the years. Yes. <laughs> He's um, doing a great job, by the way. So I just wanted to thank you for acknowledging the fact that our low-income students are facing significant gaps in their education, which is leading to many problems in terms of them being able to access college. Um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is the fact that nationally the, the conversation has shifted very much to careers rather than college. And in particular, this is impacting our students of color and low-income students much more so than their counterparts. Um, so in the meantime, while we're trying to address these gaps, I'd love to know what we can do to make sure that we have an equal representation of students of color and low-income students going to four-year colleges after they graduate from high school. Um, because it's really important that yes, that those other jobs are good paying, but in order to break the cycle of poverty, we need to make sure that they are having equal opportunity to get to college. So I mentioned a couple of things that we're doing at University of Delaware and Delaware State University, and there are the number of Delawareans uh, in both of those institutions is higher than it's ever been. The most important thing that we can do is help them afford it, really, and prepare them so that they're ready for uh, that rigor to get in, right? And um, and as it turns out, you know, we are graduating too many uh, students that aren't proficient and ready to go. In fact, I was at Delaware Tech, as I mentioned, this morning, and they have a whole uh, program for remediation of students in math, in this particular case, who weren't ready for the math that, they, that they're doing at Dell Tech, uh, let alone at the University of Delaware and Delaware State University. So we have a council called the P20 Council, that is preschool through grade 20, I guess, college, uh, that's working on just that issue. And we have a, a goal in our ESSA plan, which is Every Student Succeeds Act plan. It's a federal requirement uh, to increase those proficiency standards to just address what you're talking about. So it's got to be a combination of better prepared students academically and financially capable to meet that challenge of higher ed. Um, but I think, you know, with, res with respect to INSPIRE and uh, the SEED scholarship program, 
That's a really big deal for Delaware students at the University of Delaware and Delaware State University. Governor Mark from Newark. Hello, Governor. Um, first off, I, I would like to say that I'm very pleased to see that the state spent a lot of uh, putting emphasis on higher education. Uh, back in 2016, I decided to return to school after 15 years uh, off and uh, went back to the University of Delaware so I can obtain my bachelor's degree. Uh, I got a bachelor's in organizational community leadership in what's now the Biden Institute. Um, I'm looking to pursue law school, so I decided to um, take a couple of semesters at Delaware Tech uh, and uh, major in criminal justice. However, as a non-traditional college student who's older, um, I have a mortgage payment. Uh, one of the problems that I've noticed with Delaware Tech is uh, we rely on our financial aid and student loans to subsidize our income when we're in school. However, these funds are held uh, for over till more than 50% of the semester is completed. Um, and that, that puts a financial burden on us while we're in school. Um, other schools, such as University of Delaware, uh, disperse these funds immediately after drop ad ends, which is typically two weeks after the uh, semester starts. What can be done to make this more friendly for non-traditional students uh, who need immediate disbursements? Yeah, there's not much that we could do, I could do as governor, and, and members of the General Assembly could do, because that sounds in both cases like it's a a policy of University of Delaware and Delaware Tech. Um, we could use maybe our influence to talk to President Brainerd and President Asanis uh, to make them aware of the particular needs of, of uh, returning students like yourself. Uh, but that that is something that sounds like it's part of uh, their kind of regulatory uh, uh, environment. But something that we could certainly talk to them about. One of the, I thought you were gonna follow that up by saying students like you, and this would be true, are not eligible for a SHEED and INSPIRE scholarship, which is something that frankly I hear a lot, and we probably should look. The, the, part of the reason for that is one of the requirements, there's a GPA and other requirement for SEED and INSPIRE, right? And so if you're so many years, you know, from graduation, I don't know that they allow that. They don't allow that to happen, is my understanding. So, uh-oh. <laughs> I've done battles with this lady before. She is tough. Uh, my name is Sandra Smithers, and I'm a lifetime resident of the Woodland area. Also, I am a veteran teacher and more recently, I'm a coach of teachers with the University of Delaware's alternate routes to certification. And I am struck by the fact that teachers go into teaching with such sincere hearts and such high hopes. And normally, the novice teachers are given the most difficult classes. That's something that should change. However, uh, the one thing that I see is that there's such a gap between the culture of the teacher and the culture of the children they're teaching. And I do know that teaching is about relationships. You can, you can teach any child, almost, if you have a relationship with that child and if you have a relationship with that child's environment through the child's family. This is something that is not, teachers are not prepared for when they come out of college. Um, they're often frightened in the classroom. They don't know how to interact with the kids and therefore learning stops. And I have a, the opinion that if we can begin to bridge that gap in education and increase the, the salaries of teachers, we can begin to make some inroads into the deficits that we see in our kids. Because I've lived in a time when I grew up poor. At that time, all of us were poor. But we came out of school knowing how to read and write and articulate our thoughts clearly. That's not happening today. And that concerns me. And I'm wondering if there is anything that is in the plan to begin to prepare teachers to go into the teaching environments that they're going to be confronted by. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with your fundamental point, which is that the teacher in front of the classroom is the most important part of this whole equation. 
particularly with respect to getting children from disadvantaged backgrounds where we need them to be. Institutions of, of higher ed don't have class, classes or work to prepare teachers for teaching in those environments. And in some cases, it's got to be internships. Actually, Wilmington University does a pretty good job. They have a year-long internship program that, that is geared towards placing teachers in these environments so that they can develop those skills. The thing that just breaks your heart as you talk to these teachers, and I met with a group just uh, a week ago, and they were at an Edity Wilson School outside of Newark, and their students were doing really well. And we sat in a little round table, and more than half of the teachers said that they started their careers at Bancroft. And Bancroft, of course, is, is in the city. It's one of the schools that we're working with. It's just the school with the children that we're, we're talking about. And they spent a few years there, um, and it was challenging for them, and they decided when they had an opportunity they would go out to, to at a Wilson, and they did, and it's, they were there, most of them, 10, 12, or more years. So the challenge we have is attracting teachers to those environments in the first instance. In some cases, it becomes the last the option for teachers looking for a job, and then when they have an opportunity, they go to a, an assignment uh, that's different. Now, one of the teachers that was there said, I was there for five years, and I would have stayed, but I got riffed. And she got riffed, I assume, because they, were, they lost some funding because they're losing students, because students are choosing out of the district and going other places. And she said, I would have stayed if there was some more consistency in the teacher core, the principal. All these folks are cycling in and out so quickly that they don't develop the kind of rapport <laughs> with one another, the kind of teamwork, the kind of leadership in the principal to provide the kind of instruction and, that's really necessary. And so it, we, we're going to try to put resources to that and find different ways and instruction, maybe, to, to figure out how different children learn to read and all that. But if we don't solve this problem, it's going to be so much harder. And, and you know, we've tried a lot. I mentioned the student loan repayment thing that was oversubscribed. We've got to do that, and we've got to do more. But we also have to create an environment where those teachers feel like, hey, this is I'm really committed to this work. I want to stay here and I feel supported in what I do. And by the way, I have some help. I've got an A, I've got another teacher, I've got low class sizes. It's, we can figure it out. But if we don't figure that part out, it's going to be hard. Yes. Governor, back here. Yeah. Right back here. Kai I'm, Robinson from Wilmington. And I'm going to uh, jump in real quick. We have time for three more questions. So we're going to go here and then right up front here. And then we're going to end with Council President Anifa Shabazz across the room. And, uh, good evening, Governor. I'll try to be brief. Uh, my name is Kai Robinson. I have a company called Pro Rank Business Solutions. Uh, we specialize in diversity consulting. We're based out of Wilmington, Delaware. For the last three years, we've been working in Pennsylvania uh, with Governor Wolf's um, administration to help them basically redefine what they're doing in Pennsylvania for small, diverse businesses. Um, they're coming off the heels of a disparity study that was just conducted, I'm not sure if you're aware, but our company, our small local Delaware company, helped to drive that statewide disparity study in Pennsylvania. Um, now, in Delaware, we currently don't have um, any real goals or, or real program for minority businesses. Um, to participate on publicly funded programs. And when I mean a program, I mean a program with goals, like 10%, 15%, 20% defined percentage. Um, what's going on is, according to the uh, census, um, 2016, there was about 18,000 companies in Delaware that made the US census. Um, of those companies, uh, about 74% of those were, were purely white owned, about over 13,000. Now, um, African Americans, and, and, and that's right on point because you know Europeans, um, Caucasians make up about 69, 70% um, of the makeup of the population of the state. African Americans, however, who constitute 22.8% of the population, only represented 2.8% of the businesses. 
Um, Hispanics, who represent 9% of the population, only represented 1.8% of the businesses. So when we're talking about um, not ha having gaps in employment, it's because we have gaps in actually black and, and brown owned businesses who are going to go out there and employ our children. All right, and that's really the answer to our education problems. It's the answer to our crime problems. So I was just wondering if um, Delaware has any plans in the near future to conduct a similar disparity study so that we can create legally defensible goals in Delaware for black and brown owned businesses. Thank so the, the answer to your question about a disparate study, uh, we, uh, the last administration decided not to do one, and instead to set up and establish a DBE program in the council, like James Collins, who's the chair, I think, of the council, or at least a member of the council. Uh, have, we have plans, each of, the, each of the state agencies have goals. I just received the annual report from the Office of Supplier Diversity. It's in our division of, of small business. Yes, James? Right. Yeah. If you talk to, to Mike, he can give you the rundown on that and members of that council. But there's a, I just got a report like this about how the state is doing in various agencies uh, with respect to that. That is a priority for us. And you're right. It, it is an opportunity to address the issue issues both of employment. Does he want to talk up? Does he? You should Mike give him the mic. Jackson, put your hand up. There he is. And James is on that council, like right? Not on it, so not. He's not on it. He's shaking his head. Talk to Mike Jones. All right. To your right, Governor. It's, it's Governor, his thank head, you. Um, my name is Lisa Johnson. I'm here representing a small group um, called You Matter with the Division of Family Services. Um, and I'm a foster parent. I've been a foster parent for about 21 years in the state of Delaware. Um, through various agencies. Um, for the small percentage of children who are in foster care, what resources are being provided for this population of children who remain in care until they're 18? Um, that will help also make them successful. My second question is, um, what focuses are you giving um, in reference to the quality of care that is to be given through the foster parents, for instance? financial support um, because again um, these children are remaining in care a lot longer than what uh, is planned some of our cases and uh, that we get you know we'll have a three to six months and the children end up being there three to four years so what folks yes yeah, so i don't know the specifics about what we're doing i know it's an area of focus for secretary manning i don't think she's among us tonight uh, but I do know that we have uh, an increase in the budget for uh, foster parents, um, which is addressing some of the financial assistance part of it. But we can get answers uh, for you for the question about what's being done in terms of training and, and the rest of it. Here's the last question, Governor. Good evening, Governor. First, I want to first always thank you for your continued support of the work of the Wilmington Community Advisory Council. Um, and the work that we've gone into implementing the recommendations and findings for the Center for Disease Control that came to Wilmington and did an investigation on the epidemic of gun violence. We heard a lot of people talk about um, education and how they're so pertinent to um, the betterment and the growth of our children. And I heard you met, and I saw that you were putting money in for the way to um, I also heard the uh, memorandum of understanding that we're having with the schools, mainly for the elementary schools in the city of Wilmington. In all of that, um, we talked about, um, um, we talked about the children being a holistic, being, being able to each child is, is uh, um, an individual child. And so we know of the traumas that our young people in the city of Wilmington, I mean across the entire state are dealing with right now. The, um, could you share a little bit more on the, I think it's with the Memorandum of Understanding with the Christian School District, not only to have reading mentors, but that our children need that social service support that um, makes, to, makes, them, uh, makes them holistic for, to deal with the trauma. And the, um, one of the major recommendations from the CDC was getting uh, data sharing, so that when a child has an issue that we know across the board, all the different agencies that the state provides support to, how do we look at that child's 
complete need and be able to provide their support services on a holistic basis. So let me start with the last one first, and that's the data sharing piece. We've been working on that for over a year, and it turns out it's a lot more difficult uh, than we expected at the outset, and it's difficult for an understandable reason, and that is for privacy and confidentiality concerns. So different information on students and families can't be shared among agencies unless there's permission given. And so we've been trying to figure out ways that we could do the same kind of thing, figuring out how families and individual students are touched by a number of agencies so we can serve that child and that family uh, better without identifying their name. That's kind of hard to do. So we're working both on doing that, and that is an area that James Collins is working on. I got that one right. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to do is get the parents to sign that release, you know, when they enroll their, their child so that we can work with them. You know, the whole purpose of it is to help the family, uh, in a, to help the family better and coordinate the services. We have incredible services that are provided by different agencies that don't know about the challenges that that family and that child are dealing with, so we can better ed educate uh, those children. One of our focuses, uh, we've learned that a lot, you've worked a lot, I know, on, on after school programs and keeping uh, children and students, uh, middle school students, involved in constructive activity after they leave school. Well, part of the problem is is that uh, the purchase of care reimbursement ends at age 10, I want to say. So middle school gets to be an important area for us to focus on making sure that children have something to do, and that's something that we were focusing on and trying to kind of figure that thing out, how to better serve those children. It also goes to the observation that we lose a lot of these children in middle school, and particularly they're not able to meet that math uh, proficiency. Um, and there was one other thing that I lost my train of thought. It's changed. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I think the most important thing that we're doing, well, there are a lot of really important things that we're doing, and the teacher thing is probably the most important. But with respect to the support outside the classroom and in the schools for the, for the children we're dealing with in the Christina School District, is we're developing what's what we're calling a dual generation facility. So a parent support facility, and this is going to be at Stubbs, right? Do we have to sign on that? So it's going to be a parent support, so you can get department labor services there if you have housing issues or whatever the case may be, plus an early childhood center. So we've got to get these children before they get to kindergarten, really to get them off on the, on the, the right foot. And so having that you know, facility there at Stubbs where we're supporting the whole family, I think will really prove to be um, an important part of our approach there. But the partnership that we have with you, you complimented me, I should compliment you for that Citizen Advisory Committee is your thing. Mm -hmm. And we're pleased to be able to work with you on that. Representative Cook, take us on. Let's thank the governor for being here tonight. I know since we've been in office, we've been working hard. Uh, ever since we've been in session, out of session. Uh, my civics are here, and I want to thank my civics for being here. But most of all, I thank the diversity of this crowd for being here from up and down the whole Route 9 corridor, but also those from Belfont, those from up in Claymont, because without you all, I can't be here, we can't be here, because I don't call myself a politician, I call myself a public servant, because I am here for you. I just want to make it clear about that. First of all, give yourselves a hand for being here. I didn't get it. The governor. Thank you. Looks like right now you can take a jumper, but I think I can challenge you a little bit. Because I'm going to do just to get on play my, a little bit. Uh, transparency. Being about the people. And calls. Please call us. Please look up uh, on our websites and things of that nature. Please call us. Put them on.
Yes, sir. Um, I asked the gentleman, could the governor have 10 minutes to ask questions? By fact, this is the very first town meeting for the new elected officials. It would be applaud that we come here for an hour and a half to sit and listen to the governors make a presentation and then us not have the ability to ask a question. I am on the Governor's Commission on Correction. I'm the co-chairperson. I know majority of the honorable servants here in the community, I would say with these questions that needs to be asked to the governor, I'm quite sure he would give us an extra 10 minutes. The other thing is, transparency and morality, as the representative just said, I'm a servant to you. I'm not a politician. It's too long that we see a representative in our society that used a party instead of the, the constituents that voted that person in. He's a public servant. So it's really important for us to understand that for housekeeping purposes so that when we said transparency, any program that we ask of our public servants, that they have the same transparency of equality and morality with any agencies and any concerns that we have, they should be able to answer them. So I humbly ask that the governor, who I am on the commission on correction, will give us 10 more minutes. Governor, right, you stay around for 10 more minutes. Okay. Right? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where's uh, Brother Sessions? Is he here? He's right there. Thank you. Angela Garland, 5th District, RD Chair. Um, I had a question to ask you about, you talked about innovation and the collaboratives that you're getting to get businesses into our state. My daughter goes to early college high school at Delaware State, and I love the program, and I think it's um, amazing. She's gonna graduate high school with an associate's, basically. I would like for you to explore the, um, the parameters of when those companies come to you for discounts and tax favors to also include the high schools on being able to go to those companies and have some experience and some shadowing or something to that effect because our kids are interested in robotics, electronics, and all those things. But if they don't see something that makes sense to them, then they just know that it's coding and it's math but they need to see it in action. So I think that it's important that our state looks at fusing that gap. And if they want our tax privileges, then they should want to also encourage our children to want to get into the programs that they can offer. Well, that's a good idea. By the way, those incentives come with commitments that they make to hire people in our state. And if they don't, then we get some of that money back. I'm happy to stay if other people Thank have any more. questions, but we're, we're finished here as a group. I see some folks that have a question. Come on up here and I'll be uh, answer that. Okay, absolutely, brother.